up here. Um, and we're to get us started off, we both um, we're both kind of responding to this recording, and it's a recording of a bird song. And the bird is the dusky seaside sparrow. Um, so here's the. Oh, and just to oh. say, can we say, um, the, the sparrow, this sparrow um, went extinct in the wild in 1987, um, and in captivity in like 1990, I think. Yeah, it was declared extinct. Declared so we have a recording of a now extinct bird, so. Birds are ubiquitous poetic figures. Think of Wallace Stevens' 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, Chaucer's Parliament of Fowls, Blake's famous lines from Auguries of Innocence. A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. A dove house filled with doves and pigeons shudders hell through all its regions. Billy Collins even recently edited an anthology called Bright Wings, an illustrated anthology of poems about birds. What is more, we imagine our poetry as bird song. Barbara Hamby's Thus Spake the Mockingbird, fantastic title, uh, concludes with bird and poet speaking as one. I am the choir here, my wild throat crowd the exploding sky. Oh, I can make a noise. Just as birds move our poetic urges, we also dream of moving in birdish ways. Humanity's first powered, heavier than air flight happened at Kitty Hawk. Two, though, the ancient legend of Icarus speaks of the possible harsh outcomes to flights of fancy. Birds' songs and flight possess beauty and freedom that we find achievable in some measure, but ultimately lack. Such powerful identification and longing gives wing to myriad senses of captivation, to be moved by something, but also to be held captive. I'd like to think a little bit about the ways this particular song, the song of the dusky seaside sparrow, might be variously moving. To help me do this, I'm briefly going to turn to John Lydgate, a late medieval poet monk. Lydgate's 15th century poem, The Churl and the Bird, captures bird song's ability to move us. In the poem, a gardening peasant snares a songbird because of her efficacious singing, with which her song mocketh heavy heart to sleet, with which her song makes heavy hearts light. The line rises from rounded whispers to crisper consonants, the W's and H's of which, with her mocketh heavy heart give way to the ch of which, k of mocketh and t of heart all lifting toward the, toward the line's closing lead. Lydgate's poem imagines the bird's sonic beauty as effective. The song unburdens, makes, making listeners feel better, feel freer. And we feel the song's uplifting power embodied in the line's sounds. How does the song of the dusky seaside sparrow move us? The song is three simple notes. First, a clear whistle, then a quick turn upward, called an upslurring by the American Birding Association. Finally, a lingering, oscillating tone, making the bird's song sound querulous, perhaps anxious. With that final tremble, the three-note song is, well, dusky, a sunset song. Maybe hearing wistfulness means I'm reading into, hearing into, this small bird's call. I hear in it the fact that this records the voice of a now extinct bird. From Florida, it had the smallest range of any in North America confined to one island and a small area along the nearby St. John's River. In the mid 20th century, birders flocked to see the bird, which was included in the ABA's Checklist of North American Birds, a book Mark Jerome Walters calls the Bible of the Dedicated Bird Watcher. The bird's constrained habitat was destroyed by DDT spraying 
to sanitize NASA's Kennedy Space Center. After a much publicized last ditch attempt by Disney World to, uh, to rescue it, the dusky seaside sparrow was declared extinct in 1990. The recorded notes of an extinct bird's song score just how present species destruction is. Sound recording is distinctly modern, uncomfortably contemporary. This recording, moreover, even as it now stands in for an entire subspecies, can only ever be of a particular voice. Both the universality and the particularity of this voice's wistful sonic beauty captivates. Work by Meredith West an IU professor of psychological and brain sciences, shows that bird song instructs newer generations. Bird song's power, it seems, isn't merely a literary trope, but a natural phenomenon. It's a kind of training in birdishness. Whom does the dusky seaside sparrow's fragile triplet now train? The song's only ours now, captivating in its signification of loss and the devastating consequences of our own desires. It's a trace of one kind of birdish being, destroyed by us in a place exemplifying human ingenuity and curiosity. The moving song marks human failure to preserve and care. We might think the song an elegy, or we might join Blake's heaven, enraged at the mere caging of a single robin, let alone an extinction. The dusky seaside sparrow's song can also perhaps train us, train us by moving us, a three-note burden to care more carefully. Um, so when I first listened to uh, the Sparrow's song, I was not only struck by, um, by how clear it was and striking to hear an extinct voice, but also um, maybe most how uh, the bird was extinct in the wild the year before I was born. Um, so all my life, this bird has been gone, but I can hear it. Um, and I was, I just couldn't get over the fact that I was born into this world of lack um, and of loss, but one in which I'm sort of burdened with this knowledge. Um, and so I think that's true in a broader sense for all of us that we know our ending, our personal extinction, um, and that we have to move from that um, because we're on the outset of possibility. So the question then becomes um, the way we move through the interim. Um, and so that kind of prompted my, my poem. Uh, here, on the frontier of promise, we are all ready settled. Somehow we know it's trail to dust, though we have just begun our step, set out on plain song walk. To reunite the oxbow lakes, we lope, we know no detour for the weight of our expectancy is one we will not trade. As soon the lozenge sun dissolves us to a dusk undone, and yet our yoke may keep us young. We know what we are westing toward. We can't afford, we won't forego the going on professing yes. Oh yes, we're sure the way it's blurred that we were born for this. In, we, we kind of, in doing this conversation, wrote up our responses to the bird song and now, and then we decided to trade our responses and, and then sort of converse about what the other had right. come up with. So it's like um, a double. Yeah. yeah. So we're responding to the song and to each other's. Um, so my next short piece is, is thinking about and, and thinking with here on the frontier of promise. Knowing what we know, having the history that we have, how do we move forward? In what ways can we still talk about progress or about striving, given a history in which the dusky seaside sparrow goes extinct on NASA's doorstep? Here on the frontier of promise is about moving forward, about westing, when we know where westing has gotten us before. The poem doesn't make any promises. Any unthinking utopian fantasy of wholeness implied in to reunite the oxbow lakes or in the going on professing yes, oh yes, for sure, quickly dissolves and gets blurred. 
Rather, the poem sounds a collective drive towards, toward a still unarticulated, open-ended, and fragmenting this. We were born for this. An easier route might have been to call for new frontiers. Frontier words like promise and expectancy are pregnant with possibility and longing, linking the here and now with future fulfillment. For us now here, though, frontier fantasies are exactly what got us here now. The fantasy that what's around the corner is better, that wholeness or rescue or release can be found by moving on, that the next spot is just the right place, even if that spot belongs to someone else already. By fantasy, I don't mean a false, ultimately unreal nostalgia and unrealizable hope. That version ignores what I mean to highlight here, the powerful ways such unreal things assert very real effects. Patricia Clare Ingham argues that fantasy partakes in complex forms of enjoyment. She states, quote, psychoanalytic treatments of fantasy emphasize the limitation fantasy places on pleasure, structuring an enjoyment that resides beyond the pleasure principle. Fantasies of release or of control allure not by dangling simple pleasures in front of you, but because they allow for powerful identifications with and imaginings of different possibilities for the way the world works. Here on the frontier of promise bears the captivating power of frontier fantasy as it strives to think with that fantasy. This is no uncritical nostalgia for a romanticized American past. Instead, the poem works with a productive kind of nostalgia. Svetlana Boyim's distinction of restorative nostalgia and reflective nostalgia might be helpful here. Restorative nostalgia seeks to recreate a mythic past in search of capital T truth. In contrast, reflective nostalgia works to hold the past, with all its attendant traumas, within one's self. As Boim argues, restorative nostalgia, quote, proposes to rebuild the lost home and patch up the memory gaps, while reflective nostalgia, quote, dwells in longing and loss, the imperfect process of remembrance. I would add fantasy to Boim's formulations of nostalgia. Nostalgia is always a fantasy about what's come before and the possibilities where one can go, but not all fantasies are false trails. The plain song the poem sings is perhaps not one that mocketh heavy hearted sleep. It knows too much. It's seen and heard too much to sing about being unburdened. In this regard, it's not unlike hearing a lingering sunset in the dusky seaside sparrow's song. And though here on the frontier of promise drives us forward sonically, the propulsion is nevertheless ever so fragile. Indeed, the lozenge sun dissolves us to a dusk. Um, so uh, I wrote, or I'm going to read a poem that, that kind of responds to, to Corey's response. Um, but we've all kind of been placed in this dusk, I think. Um, and I was so struck by the idea of nostalgia as holding those, lo those losses and longings. Um, and then moving forward, and I think I think about it as a, a forward-looking nostalgia, or a nostalgia for what is yet to be, um, for a world that that we are proceeding into. Um, so, before I finish with this last poem, thank you again for coming today. And some of you have heard this one. Uh, revolution. No one denies it's dire. This decade of malaise. Our needs to hear of all the ways a spire can turn and lance us. The fancy schemes we once thought meant advance, come back to talk. We can't uncancel stamps, unlay the travertine, or unignite <coughs> machines of our own making. It's hard to walk outside a triangle's design, yet a set of them, a range, can spoke a wheel, can play a song. So here's the news. Feel it. If we choose, we can foresee a handcart in our future, whole reams of highway. And the persimmon leaves have caramelized. Today, they say, 50% chance of rain, meaning we must decide what sort of sky to buy for, where to pitch our tabernacle, here, inside. Thank you.